so much. Uh, we'll finish off by talking about primarily about Peerless 2 here, uh, the design and process of this study uh, from Minari Medical. Uh, my disclosure is obvious is that I'm an advisor uh, for the trial and the PI of the trial. So um, the idea here is to run a comparative uh, safety and efficacy trial of flow retriever large bore embolectomy against anticoagulation alone. So it's, it's the big question uh, in the embolectomy space, and to do it in a well-powered way with uh, clinically relevant outcomes. Uh, it's a potential mega trial. Uh, we're looking to randomizing up to 1,200 patients uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, age over 18, with RVL ratios greater than nine, and importantly, some enrichment criteria. And you can see here that you have to meet risk factors from two of these three categories of hemodynamics, biomarkers, and, uh, and respiratory uh, function. So this isn't purely just the high intermediate ESC criteria where you just would have an elevated troponin plus the RVLV ratio. You're gonna have to get in with one of those other criteria, like be actively dysmic or have a high heart rate. So we are trying our best to find that population of patients that seems to be intervened in, on in registry data, the higher end of the intermediate risk population. Um, patients will be randomized, as you would imagine, to uh, flow retriever versus anticoagulation alone. Uh, and all operators will have at least five case experience prior to being a trial investigator with the flow retriever. Uh, the the uh, primary endpoint is what's called a hierarchical composite win ratio. And uh, we won't have time to delve into the details of win ratios here today. But the, co but the idea here is that the most important uh, finding would be 30-day all-cause mortality. And then you'll walk your way down to clinical deterioration, which is pretty rigorously defined. Uh, but not with the new score, which is more of a continuous uh, form. This is a more clinical determination, cardiac arrest, need for new pressors, need for mechanical circuitry support, et cetera. Readmission, and then importantly, bailout. And this is a controversial area, but where we're at because of the regulatory status of these devices is that there is a lot of uh, devices that are on the market prior to the randomized data being developed, as we've spoken about. For that reason, what the fear is, is that patients who are on that higher end of intermediate risk are unlikely to be enrolled at varying sites. Uh, and we could end up in a position, and this includes in PA, Storm PE and others, where we end up with a bunch of patients who are randomized that are actually in the middle of the P, uh, intermediate scale or even the low end of the intermediate scale clinically. And the higher end are just getting intervened on because all the sites actually just believe in it already. I think this is highly likely to be happening, in fact, and a big problem for the field. So it's really important that we'd be randomizing all those patients, positive lactates, et cetera. Uh, so how did we try to account for this? Well, we built in this concept that at 72 hours, even if you're in the control arm, and this obviously can happen in the intervention arm as well, the patient can be objectively evaluated. Uh, and if they have a heart rate greater than 100, they're dysmic at rest, or they have, re or they have uh, oxygen desatura desaturations with exertion, you're allowed to cross over and it's an event. Now, uh, that, that's a key and rigorously defined bailout criteria that falls into the endpoint, but I think it makes it more likely that the trial can actually enroll as well. Uh, there are a host of secondary endpoints that will be collected out to 90 days. Um, and a host of exploratory outcomes. All these things you're interested in, especially when you have so much data. Although the trial will uh, enroll up to 1,200 patients, there are uh, pre-specified interim analyses at 500, 800, and 1,000 patients. So if things are really going in the right direction, it is possible that the trial could be stopped early, or if they're going in the wrong direction, of course, the trial could be stopped early. Um, and um, uh, and I, this is just a summary slide for all those interested in all the information that I've uh, put up there. Uh, you don't necessarily need to take a picture yet, and I'll show you why, but we are actively enrolling. Um, there's a plan for 100 total sites internationally, uh, 50 in the U.S. and 50 in Europe. Uh, half of the U.S. sites have been activated, and a small handful of the European sites have been activated. And as of April 1st, uh, about 25 patients have been enrolled worldwide in the study, although that's picking up rapidly. And why do I have to take a picture? Is because right now, like uh, as of 30 minutes ago, the trial's available, the trial design's available online, uh, published in JSKY. So just use this QR code and you can get all the details uh, of that. Uh, and just the last piece, which is just the last 30 seconds, is just also to point out that Peerless 1, which again, it, these trials have been done a little bit out of order or sequence, uh, uh, as Aki had mentioned, uh, is complete enrollment. So what was Peerless 1? Peerless 1 was actually a trial that compared catheter-directed thrombolysis with any, with any product um, you know, um, that exists against uh, flow retriever large bore mechanical thrombectomy. It had a similar primary endpoint win ratio, although different endpoints in there that included more emphasis on bleeding endpoints. And uh, that, the main point to point out here is that the patients are all enrolled, and it's expected that there will be um, data reported on this, uh, hopefully by the fall or by the new year. Um, so we'll find out uh, what that is. So given all of this, it looks like we'll have a lot of randomized data between high PITHO, PETRAC, STORM-P, P, 
Peerless 1 and 2 to really make different decisions on going forward. Level 1 evidence.